Good evening, friends. Sounds like people are sleeping already. Tonight we read together from the gospel according to John chapter 13. We read from verse 18. Jesus predicts his betrayal. Gospel according to John chapter 13 verse 18. I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly I tell you whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified Very truly I tell you one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter mentioned to his disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who it is? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread. When I have dipped it in the dish, then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what are you about to do? Do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Amen. Tonight, friends, as we continue with the Holy Week, I want to reflect with you from the scripture we have read. Jesus was betrayed but not defeated. As we gather all tonight here, I am mindful of the fact that in our daily lives, we all have Judas experience in which someone we care about or deeply love has betrayed us in some way or another. Perhaps it was a breach of confidence or trust Or maybe you were grievously betrayed and your heart was broken and you were left devastated. Everyone who's here tonight, I am sure, we have been betrayed by someone, some way or some time. Some betrayals are more devastating than others. And some of the consequences of the betrayals we ex experienced in life left us hopeless and even questioning our faith in God. Holy Week is the time in which we remember Jesus' final days on earth and a time where we remember his death, his burial, and resurrection. The days before crucifixion are recorded in all four Gospels. The story before the crucifixion of Jesus is told in all different Gospels. And these Gospels were given great insights into Jesus' teachings, words, and actions before he died. We read tonight of his teachings and his sacrificial service to others. The most significant event before to the final hours of his journey to the cross it was the last supper he had with his disciples it was Jesus when he washed the feet of his disciples the supper the bible tells us the supper took place on the evening a day before Passover feast happened 
Jesus gathered together his 12 disciples around the table and he shared a meal with them in the upper room. But as they are about to start this meal around this table, Jesus starts a critical conversation. A conversation which for others in the table was not comfortable to hear it. A conversation that was going to lead to suspicion. A conversation that was going to lead to tension. A conversation that was going to lead to doubt and hurt to others. Jesus knew the implications of the conversation he wanted to start or engage to. But he chose to continue with the conversation. Because he knew the implications of the conversations. And he knew the benefits of the conversation. And Jesus knew the costs of the conversations. In life, there are conversations which we are afraid to start. Conversations which we are avoiding to create because we are afraid of the implications of the conversations. Sometimes we protect ourselves from being harmed by conversations. Sometimes we protect people who will be hurt by conversations. Sometimes we protect the cost that we will bear when we start the conversations. I remember well Father Michael Lepsley, an Anglican priest who engaged in a conversation in the early 80s and stood out and said as a white clergy, apartheid is evil, apartheid is sin. And because of that conversation he entered to, he was bombed. But Father Lepsley never stopped to engage in that conversation. Even when he was bombed, he continued with the conversation because he knew there was hope beyond the implications of that conversation. That is why tonight around this table, Jesus is saying, I cannot avoid this conversation. I need to enter into this conversation. Sometimes, as the church, we tend to avoid some conversations because we are afraid we will lose membership of the church. Sometimes as the church, we tend to avoid some conversations because we are afraid of being unpopular to the church members. Sometimes as the church, we are afraid to start conversations with the powers that being in the state because we are afraid we will not be friends and not benefit from the benefits of the state. But because we want not to betray the gospel, we want not to betray the one who has called us, we cannot avoid some conversations. Even if they will cost us, even if they will make us enemies of the state, even if those conversations will lead to schism of the church, but if those conversations, they are to bring about the gospel truth, we cannot avoid those conversations. It is around this table where Jesus is deeply troubled in his soul, is deeply troubled in his soul, and is saying, one of you will betray me. And they were all doubting, and they were all suspicious, and they were all worried, is it me? And then Jesus said, the one I will give bread to is the one who will betray me. And Jesus dipped the bread and gave the bread to Judas. And Judas indeed sold Jesus Christ with 30 silver coins to the authorities so that they may kill Jesus Christ. Thank you to, Jesus, to, to Judas for selling Jesus with 30 silver coins, so that me and you can be delivered from the bondages of sin. Thank you to Judas for
for selling Jesus with 30 silver coins so that me and you can experience abundant life in Christ. So that we may experience the fullness of God's love because of that 30 silver coins that you paid. The scripture is silent about Judas. We hear less about Judas from the scripture. I'm not sure why. But when I looked, Judas is a 12th apostle who was chosen by Nathaniel. He was born in a town of Kiriot, a small town in southern Judea. He lived also in Jericho. The parents of Judas were Sadducees. And Judas later joined the band of John's disciple. And because of that, his parents disowned him. When Nathaniel met Judas at Tarukia, he was seeking employment with a fish drying enterprise at the lower end of the Sea of Galilee. Judas had a skill of trade. Judas had a skill of making money. And his skill was used and was identified. And he was appointed to be the money keeper of the group of disciples. Listen to this. He was skilled. He was gifted. He was talented. But his gifts, his, his talents were not aligned to the values of Christ. And his gifts, because they were not aligned to the values of Christ, they tend to be a weakness. God against your gifts, if they are not aligned to the values of Christ, they might turn to be a weakness. It is his gifts that led him to hang himself because his gifts were not aligned to the values of Christ, were not centered unto the values of Christ. We learn from the scripture that on the evening when a woman came to break the expensive alabaster jar oil and was anointing the feet of Jesus, it was Judas who stood out and said, why wasting this perfume? We could have sold it and then give it to the poor. And Jesus is scolding him and saying, you will always have the poor amongst yourself. Judas was not concerned about the poor, was concerned of his selfish interests because he knew the more money comes in, the more he will get money, the more he will squander money. He, Judas, when he was saying we could have sold this to the poor, he forgot that the Jesus who was around knew the depths of his heart. He might hide it and act in front of us, but in the presence of God, God knew the depths of his heart. Tonight, I want to talk about three things. Then we pray. Betrayal of Jesus emerged from the one closer to him. Jesus was betrayed by a close friend. Jesus was not betrayed by a stranger. Judas was a disciple of Christ. Judas spent three years with Christ in a journey. Judas learned from Christ. Judas knew Jesus Christ. Judas has been exposed to the teachings and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Judas knew that despite of his weaknesses, Jesus loved him so much and unconditionally. Just being closer Judas, having been traveling with Jesus for three years, having been exposed to the teachings of Jesus and miracles of Jesus, that never guaranteed the loyalty of Judas to Jesus Christ. The time spent by Judas with Jesus Christ in a journey, the miracles seen by Judas in these three years never guaranteed the loyalty of Judas. This reminds me and teaches me 
coming to church every Sunday, going to a home group every Wednesday, giving money to the church, giving donations to the work of the church, it is not a guarantee that we are loyal to Jesus. Are we together? Our acts, our works, is not measuring our loyalty to God. As much as Judas traveled with Jesus for three years, but he was still disloyal to Jesus. Still Judas was not committed to Christ. Judas knew that Jesus loved him. Jesus trusted him. And Judas knew that Jesus has a mission that is entrusted to Judas. But still Judas broke the trust of Jesus. Still Judas betrayed, chose to betray Jesus Christ. To be with Jesus at the Last Supper, it was a sacred moment, and Judas was part of that great moment and that great meal. To be washed his feet by Jesus, it was a sacred moment, and the feet of Jesus were washed by Jesus also. In all of Judas' journey with Jesus, he was never judged by Jesus. He was never excluded by Jesus. Instead, Jesus made him not to feel like an outcast. His tribal background, his cultural background, his past failures never excluded him from the love of Jesus. But above all, what I have mentioned in turn, Judas became the one who betrays Jesus, become the one who sells Jesus to the authorities, become the one who was supposed to be loyal and devoted to Jesus, but instead he chose to betray Jesus Christ. Even today, you will not struggle to find the betrayers of Jesus. They stand in front of us and preach the gospel. They stand in front of us and they lead us in worship. They fill the church pews every Sunday. Meanwhile, they are not living by the gospel values and teachings. The betrayers of Jesus, they read Bible daily. The betrayers of Jesus, they come to church daily. You will not struggle to find Judas of our time. The betrayers of the gospel, they confess Jesus with their lips, but their hearts are not saying that. As the church of today and as followers of Jesus, we have become the betrayers of the gospel by our words by our deeds and our thoughts. When the church neglects the plight of the poor, that is a betrayal to Jesus Christ. When the church discriminates people because of their racial backgrounds, of their tribal backgrounds, of their sexual orientation, that is a betrayal to Jesus Christ. When the church discriminates people because they are gays and lesbians, it's a betrayal to Jesus Christ. When the church discriminates people because they are alcohol and drug addicts, it's a betrayal to Jesus Christ. The moment the church sets standards, who is welcome in this church, it's a betrayal to Jesus. Because the head of the church, which is Jesus, he dined with the great curse collectors. He spent time with the sinners. He spent time with the outcasts. He spent time with the prostitutes. Who are we to set standards for people as the church? The moment we set standards for people, it is a betrayal to Jesus Christ. When the church is silent, when those in power to govern the nation and they are abusing the power through corruption and injustice, the silence of the church is a betrayal to Jesus Christ. The prophetic voice of the church it is a gospel truth to Jesus Christ. Even if it will cost us, but the moment we speak, it is gospel truth to Jesus Christ. As a, as a Methodist, I'm reminded, the founder of Methodist Church once said, I am not afraid, John Wesley says, I am not afraid that the people called Methodist should ever cease to exist, either Europe or America. But I am afraid that 
they should only exist as a dead sect having the form of religion without power and this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast both doctrine, spirit and discipline with which they first set out. The moment as the church we betray Jesus Christ as the church we're becoming a mockery and a betrayer to Jesus. Secondly, Jesus Christ was betrayed by affections. It was the kiss that betrayed Jesus Christ. A kiss in a Jewish context, it was a sign of greeting. It was a sign of embracing. It was a sign of love. Most of the times, we normally buy flowers. We normally buy chocolates. We normally go out on a date. We normally go out sometimes to jazz festival. All of that, it is just an affection. Don't be fooled by affection and think that that is what comes from the heart. Learn from Jesus. Affection betrayed Jesus Christ. It was affection that led Jesus Christ to his death. Judas' kiss was going to pinpoint Jesus. I, I want to assume the reason being G Judas did not want to pinpoint Jesus. He was afraid that he would be seen as selling Jesus. But not knowing that, the one he was betraying knew more than his affections. We might act and act before the world but we cannot act before God. We can be dramatic about our faith, but in the presence of God, we cannot be dramatic. God knows everything about us. Judas' kiss on the cheek and the warm embrace in the Jewish culture revealed a personal and affectionate friendship for the fellow Jew. But that kiss of that night it was accompanied with betrayal. It is one kiss that opened doors for everyone to be saved. It is a kiss that was done 2,000 years, but that kiss even today is still warming our hearts. The kiss that happened 2,000 years is the kiss that united us with God. The kiss that reconciled us with God. Display of affection don't ensure faithfulness and loyalty. Display of affection doesn't display faithfulness and loyalty. It might be an affection accompanied by disloyalty and betrayal. Sometimes I know an expression of love is through good acts or through good deeds. But that does not measure loyalty. Some mission progress of the church, they are not godly driven, but it is all about boosting the ego of the church, and that is betrayal to Jesus Christ. Betrayal to Jesus Christ is always wrapped with affection. Sometimes we betray Jesus as the church intentionally or unintentionally. Some people through worship and service, it's about their own selfish ego. It's about their own popularity. And all of that, it is affection. God knows the depths of our heart. Psalm 139 asks the question, Lord God, where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go? You are there, whatever I do, you know. God knows everything about us. He knows when we are acting, and God knows when we cheat him. God knows our affections, says 
we are one and undivided church. But the truth and the reality, we are still a divided church. Such statements are just an affection before God. God knows the reality and the matter that we are still far, far from unity. All the words are just an affection. God knows as South Africans when we stand and declare that South Africa belongs to all and the wealth of the South Africa shall be shared by all. It is just an affection, such a statement. We still know that economic inequities exist in our country and the wealth of this country belongs to certain minority. And all of that, it is just an affection before God. Our affections says we are faithful and loyal to our partners, but God knows that we are not. It's just an affection. God knows through our singing, preaching, giving, we express our affections for him, but God knows the depths of our heart. Lastly, the third point, Jesus is loving beyond betrayal. Jesus is loving beyond betrayal. The betrayal of Judas never changed the plan of God for humanity to save them from the wrath of sin. Because the love of God is unchanging. The love of God endures forever. The love of God is faithful. The love of God is unconditional. The love of God is not changed by us, but the love of God changes us. The love of God is not tested nor moved by our actions. But the love of God moves and changes our action. The love Jesus had for all humanity did not exclude Judas. It included Judas also. The love of God is not shaken by what we do, but the love of God is constant. The love of God does not write us off. The love of God does not give up on us. Even when we least deserve that love, but God continues to love us. The one that the love of God is the love that makes us right with God. The love that unites us with God. As we approach Good Friday, I want to say the cross of Christ is in front of us. It is a symbol of God's inevitable love, God's forgiveness. The invitation tonight is open to us all to turn away from our wickedness and turn to God in faith. God is just and God is merciful and God is willing to forgive us. Jesus was betrayed by Judas but that betrayal had no power to stop God's love for him. Even the cross even the grave had no power to stop God's love. The God we worship is the most powerful God. Nothing can stand before God. Nothing can hold God to fulfill his plan about your life. Yes, no betrayal can defeat God. No sin can defeat God. No darkness can defeat God. That love is still available for us all. Even those who feel rejected, even those who feel betrayed and defeated by love, that love is available for me and for you. Amen. Come, let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, for your word that reminds us even betrayals will not defeat you. Thank you, Lord God, for reminding us no power can hold you from fulfilling your plan for us. It is our prayer as we go, Lord God, and approach Good Friday. May you remind us of your love, of your grace, of your forgiveness. Bless us, Lord God.